Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about Math 121, Section 1.1, and we'll start off with some definitions. So first, what is data or data? Well, that's collections of measurements, observations, and responses. Collections of measurements, observations, and responses. So data is just, you know, what we think of data as. It could be measurements, it could be observations, it could be answers to questions. It's just different things we have. What are statistics, though? What is statistics? Statistics is the science of planning a study, collecting the data, and then analyzing and forming conclusions analyzing and forming conclusions. So statistics is the science of planning a study, collecting the data, and then analyzing and forming conclusions. In statistics, a lot of times we're interested in what the population is. The population is the complete group of measurements being considered. The complete group of all measurements being considered. The complete group of all measurements that are being considered. Now, from a population, we can collect two types of groups. We can collect a census, which is data collection on an entire population. And the word census should ring a bell. We had a census um, earlier this year. 2020 was a census year. So it's collection data on the entire population. Whereas a sample is a subgroup of a population on which data is collected. It's not the whole population, it's just a small subgroup of the population. That is a sample. Think about it like when you go to a restaurant and you take a sample of something. You go to the grocery store and take a sample. You're not taking the whole thing, right? You're just taking a small chunk of it to try. So census and sample, those are kind of similar definitions, right? It's are you collecting data on the whole population or just a small group? And in that theme, let's check out an example. In a recent journal article, it was stated that there are 38 million carbon monoxide detectors in the US. When 30 of them were randomly selected and tested, it was found that 12 of them failed to work properly. What is the population for this study? What is the sample? Well, the population, the population's everything being considered. That'd be 38 million CO detectors in the US. Population is all 38 million CO detectors in the US. That is the entire group being considered, right? We're talking about carbon monoxide detectors in the US. That's the whole group. What's the sample? The sample is the 30 that were tested. The population is all 38 million of them. The sample is the 30 that were tested, right? We took a small sample. Now, why would we have a population and then take a sample? Well, let's think about it. 
if you were testing the safety of carbon monoxide detectors and you were performing this study, is it reasonable to expect you to take data on all 38 million of the detectors? No, you'd be, you know, you'd never have enough time to do it. That's why we work with samples, because we can draw conclusions about the sample and then infer them about the whole group. So samples and populations. Now, that first page, a little bit writing heavy, right? It's all definitions. Second page, kind of the opposite. Almost no writing on this page. So more of a listening sort of exercise, right? The following flowchart walks through the most important steps when considering a statistical study. The steps can be broken into three major categories, preparing, analyzing, and conclusion. Those are the three big steps, prepare, analyze, conclude. We will be spending our semester chipping away at different steps of this process, but for now we're going to focus on preparing. Let's focus on the preparing step. That'll be our first focus. And then we'll make um, jumps to the other ones as we transition through the semester. So in preparing, the first step is context. What does the data represent? What is the goal? The source of the data? Are the data from a source with a special interest so there might be bias to obtain certain results? Sampling method. How was the data collected? Did someone just ask their friends? Did they do a rigorous sampling method? Did volunteers um, have a bias? Did the sample have a bias? That's how we prepare a study. How do we analyze a study? Well, we graph and explore the data. This will be most of chapters 3 through six we'll be analyzing data for now we'll just talk about the big headers graphing exploring and applying the methods but that'll be later in the course right we'll be analyzing data and then lastly conclusion when we're concluding stuff do the results have statistical significance that means with statistics can you mathematically prove what is happening that doesn't necessarily mean your results have a practical use or are practically significant. Just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean it's practically significant. And we'll talk about conclusions and things like that later on in the course as well. For now, we're going to spend our time preparing. We're going to look at how to prepare statistical studies. Lots of definitions. So an example, boats and manatees. The following table contains data from the Florida DMV and the Florida Marine Research Institute over several recent years. The table shows the number of pleasure boats, non-commercially operated, and the number of manatee fatalities. We'll use this example to answer the following questions. So I'm going to keep this close so I can refer back to it as we answer these following questions on the next page. What is the context of this study? What do we think the context of the study is? Well, why would we be keeping track of pleasure boats and manatee fatalities? What would be our goal? Maybe we're looking for a relationship between the number of pleasure boats and the number of manatee fatalities. We are looking for a relationship between, I abbreviated between, the number I abbreviated number of boats and fatalities. Fatalities here referring to manatees, right? We're looking for a relationship between them. We're trying to find a relationship between the number of pleasure boats and the manatee fatalities. That's the context, right? That's be why we'd be doing this study. Why are we collecting data on boats and manatees? Well, we're looking for a connection, right? What are the sources and are they reputable? What are the sources? Well, the boat data came from the Florida DMV and the marine uh, manatee data came from the Marine Institute, Florida DMV and Marine Research Institute. Are they reputable? Is there any reason to believe the DMV or the Marine Institute would be lying about these numbers? Not likely, right? The DMV needs to keep track of how many boat licenses there are in the area. 
The Marine Research Institute needs to keep track of how many fatalities there are for manatees. Since they are government agencies directly studying the data, they appear reputable, right? Reputable. Since they're government, ages, direct, government agencies directly studying the data, they're reputable, right? Oops, I forgot the RE. They're reputable. Does the sampling method appear to be sound? How was this data sampled? It looks like it was collected from records from those previous years, right? Is there any bias when reading old records? Is there any opportunity for misinformation to be collected from the sampling? No, right? Does the sampling appear to be sound? Yes. It is based on government records. It appears to be a sound way to gather your data, right? So we looked at some context there. We looked at some of the information. We broke down some of the preparing step. Notice we kind of had to use our intuition, right? We had to think about these preparing steps to answer these questions. Now, what is a voluntary response sample? Our next definition is a sample where subjects choose whether or not to participate. It's voluntary. Think of phone-ins, phone calls, Facebook polls. Um, if you're watching the news and they say to tweet at them with your thoughts on it, those are all voluntary response samples, right? You choose whether or not you take part in them. Nobody's making you. There's no incentive to take part in them. You just elect to take part in it. It's voluntary response. An example, the TV show Nightline asked viewers to call with their opinion on whether the United Nations headquarters should remain within the U.S. They found that 67% of the 186,000 callers said the U.N. should move outside the U.S., in a separate study, 500 subjects were randomly selected and asked the same question. In this group, 38% wanted the UN to move outside of the US. Which study had the more reliable sampling method? Notice we got very different answers, didn't we? Which one would be more reliable though? The call-in survey or the random one? Even though it's smaller, the random one will be more reliable. The random sample is more reliable because there is no room for bias. Let's think about it for a second. If you're a viewer of Nightline and they put a phone number up on the screen and ask you to call with your opinion on the UN headquarters, if you're kind of in the middle and don't really care, are you going to take the time out of your day to phone up this TV show and give them your opinion? No. You're only going to take that time if you're heavily invested in the topic. You're not going to take the time to voluntarily respond if you're not invested in the topic. Voluntary response samples automatically create bias. So keep that in mind uh, moving forward. If subjects elect to participate it automatically leads to bias random is always better because it's totally random who is in the sample there's no room for bias it's random right notice the number doesn't really matter as much the way you collect the data is better a good way to think about that is if I you know have a hundred data points but I know 99 of them are biased that's useless data right but if I have 20 data points and I know all of them are good, unbiased data points, that's a lot better study, right? It's always better to be unbiased and random than to be larger numbered and biased. Now, 
what are some pitfalls we might encounter throughout our course? And here we're going to have a few um, options. There's, I believe, six of them on this page. These are some pitfalls we typically run into when dealing with um, analyzing data. So let's real quick run through these. First, we should avoid misleading conclusions. When possible, our conclusions should be as clearly stated as is reasonable. We don't want to mislead with our conclusions and we don't want to make unjustified statements. Do not make unjustified statements. Conclusions should be clear and accurate, not making unjustified statements. This happens all the time in statistics, where a study might hint at something but not really justify it. You should not include that in conclusion then if it's only hinting at it. Unless it's a strong justification, you should not include that in your results. You should not use misleading conclusions. A great real life example of that is recently the CDC put out an article saying that only 6% of COVID-19 deaths in the United States did not have underlying conditions. That is not what was really said. The CDC statement actually says that the death certificates of um, COVID-19 fatalities, only 6% of them list no other causes of death. Now, does that mean that some of these people had underlying conditions? Yes. Um, does that mean that all of those other 94% did? No. It just means that different things were stated on the death certificates for those people than simply COVID-19. Um, that statement that the CDC recently released has been getting tons of news traffic. All sorts of misleading conclusions coming from that. Um, it's a great example of the statistics um, are there and the statistics are sound, right? The data is sound, but the conclusions being made are all over the place. All of these different conclusions cannot be true. The data only leads to one conclusion. And you need to be careful when deciphering news that you are taking the true conclusions and not taking those unjustified statements without doing your own further looking. Next, sample data reported instead of measured. If data is measurable, then do not ask for it to be reported, for it to be reported, always measure it. A great example of this, let's say you're doing a study on weight and you want to get a bunch of subjects weights. What's the best way to get somebody's weight? Is it to ask them or put them on a scale? which is going to give you the more accurate data. Putting them on the scale, right? Actually measuring the weight will give them a more accurate result. People can lie, right? They might not even realize they're lying. Maybe they didn't weigh themselves recently. Maybe they've started dieting and didn't realize they lost as much weight as they did. There's all sorts of reasons why somebody reporting their weight to you could be misleading, even if they don't realize it. You should always measure when you can. So when you can measure, measure. Measuring is always better. Next, loaded questions. We avoid loaded questions that are designed to elicit a certain response.
Whenever possible, you should avoid using any words that will lead to a specific response. For example, um, our current president is a member of the Republican Party. If I was surveying a group of Democratic um, uh, subjects, I have a sample of Democratic subjects, and I want to ask them some questions. If I want to ask any questions about presidential power, I should avoid using Donald Trump's name instead of just saying the president or should a president have this power. Because if I use Donald Trump's name in the sentence, the liberal subject uh, members will be more likely to answer in a negative manner because his name is loaded for the question. It's eliciting a certain response from them. If I say, should Donald Trump have the power to veto waste management services, or should a president have the power to veto waste management services, those will elicit totally different responses. So keep that in mind, that you should avoid biased question asking as well. And it might seem weird that questions can be biased, but we just had some examples, right? You can totally have biased questions. Next, order of questions. Sometimes, the order of the questions and or the question choices will affect the outcome. Sometimes the order you ask the question in will affect the outcome. On the next page, we'll have a good example that I took from the book, but think about it this way. If a question in a survey precedes one that relates to the same topic, that person is already gonna have their previous answer in their mind when they get to that second question. They're already gonna have their mind made up. So a common way people avoid this issue is to give each subject a randomized question order. Or, if you have two questions, give half the people question one followed by question two, give the other half question two followed by question one. That's called counterbalancing. Or, you're balancing your questions, right? You're balancing the order. You're avoiding any potential bias just based on the order of the questions. And we'll see a really cool example of that on the next page that I have taken from the book. Next, non-response occurs when a subject does not respond or refuses to participate participate in a study sometimes people won't answer your study Maybe the questions themselves are controversial. Maybe they don't want to answer you specifically. Maybe both. Let's think about some scenarios. Let's say somebody is doing a study on marijuana usage in college students. If, you know, the local DARE enforcement officer walks up to your door, knocks on the door, and asks you, hey, are you a college student who uses drugs? You're going to answer that question very differently than if your friend approaches you and asks you that same question, or if it's an anonymous survey that asks you that same question. Um, you might not respond to certain options, right? Who's asking the questions um, might um, elicit certain responses. Maybe you just really don't like the person who's coming and asking the questions at your door and you don't want to answer them. Maybe you don't want to take the time out of your day to participate in the study. Non-response happens for a number of reasons. Um, but sometimes that happens, right? Sometimes subjects don't want to participate in a study. Nothing we can do about it, right? People have the right to choose whether they participate or do not in statistical studies. And then percentages. With percentages, we cannot reduce a value by more than 100%. If something claims to reduce something by more than 100%, they are lying. If you take 100% away from something, you're left with nothing. A great example of that, um, 
would be those infomercial ads that you see on TV. Um, reduces headache pain by 300%, new Tylenol Pro. If a Tylenol Pro reduces your headache pain by 100%, your headache pain is gone. You've taken 100% of your headache pain away. Using the number 300% is nothing but misleading. So we should avoid percentages that reduce by more than 100%. Now you can increase by more than 100%. Maybe it says, you know, um, Lucky Stars Investment Firm will increase your money by 300%. That's possible, right? Because you can increase something by more than 100%. If you triple something, you increased it by 200%. So you can't reduce by more than 100, but you can increase by more than 100. So reduction is the key here. Keep in mind, percentages can be misleading. This usually happens in commercials. Um, so we should avoid those potential pitfalls. So those are six types of pitfalls we may hit. Um, those are not the only ones. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of different pitfalls you can fall into when working through statistical studies. These are some of the biggest ones, though. So let's take a look at some examples of these. I stole a couple from the textbook in addition to the ones we just talked about, but I wanted to highlight these ones. Here's an order of questions making a difference. This is from a very real study that asked the question, would you say traffic contributes more or less to air pollution than industry? Versus, would you say that industry contributes more or less to air pollution than traffic? Those are the same question. It's asking you to compare pollution from traffic and industry. They're not different. The only difference was the order they were asked in. Did it mention traffic or industry first? In the first example, most people blamed traffic and it came first in the question. In the second example, most people blamed industry, and it came first in the question. That is very common. A lot of people choose the first option in a question more frequently than the second option. That's just an inherent bias that tends to happen in questions. I'm not really sure why, but if someone's not really sure, because I myself, I have no idea. Does traffic or industry pollute more? I would hazard a guess that industry does, but you never know, right? I'm not a, um, a pollution scientist. I'm not a expert in that field. I don't know. So if I was going to take a stab at it, who knows which one I would pick depending on which question I'm asked. The order can make a difference. So be careful with that. I found this really interesting the first time I saw it. Secondly, some thoughts on non-response from a gentleman named Michael Wheeler who wrote lies, damn lies, and statistics. He says, people who refuse to talk to pollsters are likely to be different from those who do not. Some may be fearful of strangers or others jealous of their privacy, but the refusal to talk demonstrates that their view of the world around them is different from those who will let poll takers into their homes. That's true, right? If someone knocks on your door and asks if you will answer some survey questions, right away they're already asking you a question, yes or no, will you participate? Those people who say yes already have a difference in opinion than those people who say no. Your results are already biased, right? Those non-responses are important to keep track of. It's always important to notice when non-responses happen um, because it might be part of an issue with your study. And then thirdly, an example of bias towards positive results. And this is a little tiny on the camera, but hopefully you can read it on your own copies of the paper. It says, there is a publication bias in professional journals. It is the tendency to publish positive results that show that something is effective much more often than negative results that show something is ineffective. Now, if you do research and so something does not work, that is just as meaningful, scientifically speaking, as showing something does work. However, medical journals, science journals, mechanical journals, mathematics journals, all have a tendency to publish positive results far more frequently. It goes on um, to talk a little bit more about it. Feel free to read along um, uh, and continue. But be aware that there are biases even in professional journals. Um, biases 
are all around us in statistics, right? There's always going to be biases we have to be aware of, and we want to try and limit those biases as much as possible in our studies. And that brings us to the end of section 1.1. I thank you all for joining me, and I will see you next time.